Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you on this uh, sunny afternoon. Uh, it's a delight for me to speak to you about Chiari malformations in adults. You will note on some of the slides that they're a little bit dense, and the reason for that is we have both physicians and patients. Uh, I, I will keep this at a level of what I do when I speak with a patient regarding their potential diagnosis of a Chiari malformation using the slides as a template. And the order that I typically go through with a patient is the answer to the four questions. What do I have? Meaning what's really going on from an anatomical standpoint? Number two, what does it mean to have it? What are the symptoms and the physical findings that we see on a physical exam? Number three, what can you do about it? <clears throat> and in this case, it's a surgical intervention. And number four, what are the risks associated with that surgery? So we'll try to quickly go through that so that you have the opportunity to ask questions. And this is basically a definition of what Chiari is. And in the adult form, we're really only talking about Chiari 0, Chiari 1, and 1.5. And so what does that mean? It means that the back part of your brain, the part of your cerebellum called the cerebellar tonsils, will protrude through the base of your skull called the frame and magnum and it creates tightness. Uh, and it, you can have associated with that because of that tightness, abnormal flow of your brain water to create hydrocephalus. Or as you can see, it can create something called syringomyelia, which is fluid within the, within the, um, uh, within the spinal cord. In addition to that, the Chiari zero is one where you can have fluid within the spinal cord called syringomyelia, but no downward protrusion of the cerebellar tonsils. And then <clears throat> with Chiari 1.5, there can be some kinking of the brainstem. And in that form also the, the brainstem, part of the brain comes down through the base of the skull as well. And this is an example of what we uh, look for when we get an MRI scan. Here you can see that the the bottom of the skull goes from this line to this line, and you can see this part of the brain, the cerebellar tonsils, is protruding down through this area called the foramen magnum. And there's a little bit of kinking of the brainstem here as well. Uh, so the workup for this after a patient comes in involves the getting these MRI scans. <clears throat> it can also be associated with hydrocephalus meaning there's water on the brain that will push the brain down. So in elderly patients that present with Chiari malformation, we always look for, uh, for the uh, 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 hydrocephalus. And as I said, in the Chiari 1.5, the back part of the brain here called the fourth ventricle marks the, the, uh, the brainstem. And this brainstem here, the medulla is also downward, downwardly herniated through the foramen. And that's what makes it 1.5. But the classifications are not important uh, 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 beyond the symptoms that you have. In addition to the workup that we have for pa uh, patients with MRI scans, we will frequently do something do, called a Cine MRI. And what this is showing here is it shows the flow of the brain water. And you can see that on the front part of the brain, there's good flow, but on the back part. In severe cases, we won't see any of this darkness indicating that there is obstruction to brain water. And I just wanna focus a little bit on the term syringomyelia, but in lay terms, that's just the water within the spinal cord. And that is of importance because it it dictates a more rapid response on the part of, of the surgeon to address the problems that uh, we need to address. It occurs in about 50 to 80% of the cases. And you can see here what it looks like as we, we typically get MRI scans of the entire spinal cord. And you can see within the spinal cord is this fluid chamber. And the theory behind why this forms is that the water can't get past the brain here, so there's pulsations, and over time, it will gradually dissect down into the spinal cord and form this 
thing called a syrinx within the spinal cord. So how does a patient typically present and why do we get those images? In the adult population, most patients will present with headache at the base of their skull, uh, and then it will radiate up, to, radiate up to the top of their skull, but it can also radiate down into their neck, into their shoulders, and in their hands. So there's the correlated headache uh, 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 associated with uh, shoulder and arm pain. <clears throat> in addition to that, worsening symptoms and uh, can can develop and what we also ask is that pain is it made worse by exacerbated by what's called the valsalva maneuver and what that is is straining with lifting straining with a bowel movement you know blowing on your thumb when you're trying to pop your ears in the airplane what that does is it tightens up the muscles in your abdomen so the blood can't flow out of your brain and it increases the pressure inside your brain and it pushes those cerebellar tonsils down further. <clears throat> you can have sensory loss, it's, and the, the classic term is called cape-like sensory loss, which, in which case you lose the sensation over your shoulders and over your spine. If one doesn't pay attention to the symptomatology, I've I had patients come into me with complaints of, I can't open a jar, I can't button my blouses, my hands are weak. In severe cases, the muscles within the hands uh, have uh, atrophied or gotten smaller. And in really severe cases, patients will note that they have a change in their voice. It becomes more hollow or more gravelly. They have difficulty with swallowing. Uh, further progression would involve bowel and bladder function and even, even lower extremity dysfunction. <clears throat> That is not the typical form. I mean, the typical form that I see when a patient comes in is the headache at the base of their skull, pain radiating down into their shoulders and their hands, and early signs, sometimes they say they just have a hard time opening up their, uh, 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 opening up jars. The um, headache is somewhat age dependent uh, in, in, in children, you can note that they start uh, tipping their head back. And when I'm seeing a patient on their physical exam, which is usually pretty normal, except for the headache, but if I ask them to flex their head back or tip it back, they can see the onset of uh, pain going in their skull base and then radiating it up towards the top of the head. The headache can be constant, it can be variable. As I said, it can be a, a brought on by bearing down with the lifting something or with a with a, uh, a, 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 a straining for a bowel movement. As it says here on the bottom of the slide, the raised intracranial pressure. So you, with a sneeze, with a cough, and, and these uh, motions that increase the pressure in your abdomen. <clears throat> in children, it is the most frequent complaint. In adults, uh, I also find it to be certainly the earliest sign and, it, and then we have to have the conversation about how bad is the headache? Is it disabling? Uh, and, and when do we really want to uh, 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 pursue intervention? So the, the key to having good surgical results is having a very clear conversation with, with you, the patient, about what are your expectations? If the headache is all you have and it's not terribly significant, we can watch it for a while and see whether it progresses over time. Prior to that, we certainly get an MRI scan of the spine. And if there is that fluid chamber in the spine, then I urge you to consider surgical intervention. If you have hydrocephalus, water on the brain, uh, 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 we then uh, uh, you know, still would consider doing the decompression uh, because that allows us to avoid having to put a permanent piece of hardware in. That usually will be uh, therapeutic, but sometimes uh, we do end up having to put in what's called a shunt. So <clears throat> what is the standard surgical procedure for a Chiari malformation? That really is the only therapy. Uh, once the symptoms get bad enough, and that is intolerable headache, intolerable shoulder arm pain, intolerable hand pain, uh, 
hand weakness. Uh, uh, in, in those scenarios, we would, or I would uh, advocate surgical intervention. And you can see here that we take out about a three centimeter piece of bone. I refer to this as cosmetic surgery of the skull. And this is on the back of your skull. Uh, we may, you can feel the bump on the back of your head and then you slide right down the middle to the soft part in your neck. So the incision goes from that bump on the back of the head right down to the soft spot in your neck. And then we move the muscles apart so we have access to the skull and we take out three centimeters and it's key that you get all the way out to the most lateral part of that hole called the foramen magnum. And then we also take off the bone of the first cervical lamina. Now, don't worry, this doesn't cause instability. As part of the evaluation, we make sure that you don't have any cranial cervical instability. We uh, test you with flexion extension. If there is any concern, we get special imaging to make sure uh, that that isn't a problem. And we make sure that you don't have uh, certain uh, connective tissue diseases like Ehlers-Danlos or Marfan's where we would be a uh, where we would be very concerned. As I said, we do the, uh, uh, so we do the cosmetic surgery of the skull base here by just taking the bone off and then taking off the first cervical lamina. Uh, and, and that adequately decompresses it from a bony standpoint. Then there's always the debate about whether we need to open up the covering of the brain called the dura mater. Uh, I am a strong advocate of doing this uh, for the reason that the dura in adults is certainly not very lax. And just by decompressing it from a bony standpoint, doesn't really create a lot of space. So the concern is that by just doing the bone, we're not really opening things up. Uh, uh, so then uh, uh, after we do this decompression, we open up the covering of the brain called the dura, and you can see the cerebellar tonsils protruding down. I open up the what's called the arachnoid, this thin little film, so that there's free flow of the brain water from that fourth ventricle down into the space around the spinal cord. And then uh, it, you know, it looks like this here, you can see the cerebellar tonsils sticking down into the spinal cord level to the level of C1. So we open this all up so there's free flow of brain water, that's how hydrocephalus gets treated. Uh, if that is part of this syndrome. Uh, uh, and then we uh, sew a patch into place and tip, we can use uh, part of the uh, 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 skin underneath or uh, over your skull uh, called the, uh, 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 fa it's fascia. Or what I like to use is uh, 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 something called Alamax, which is human cells that have been grown, but then they've been autoclaved and they're basically not alive. And it makes a beautiful patch that we can sew into position in a watertight fashion. And then we close things up. One of the concerns with, with taking the bone out, people will ask about is, you know, am I not at risk? Uh, and I would say that, yes, you're at risk for very sharp objects, but you have very thick musculature that you can feel on the back of your head that protects you from any kind of blunt issue. And as long as your neck and spine are stable, which we've already ruled out, uh, we're not concerned about there being uh, 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 any, any issue. If the hydrocephalus would persist, we would then put a shunt in place, which is a tube that runs from the, 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 the fluid chambers in your brain down into your belly. But that is exceedingly rare to have to do uh, 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 in an adult population. So in, in, in summary, the symptoms that you come complaining with are headache and pain in the shoulders and arms and hands. On occasional uh, uh, cases, patients will complain of swallowing difficulty and voice changes. <clears throat> the evaluation is purely done with an MRI scan and a Cine MRI scan. The treatment of choice is surgical decompression. There is debate about which is the best surgery, splitting that dura, opening the dura, putting in a patch. And I think that you need to talk to each surgeon and get their opinion. My, In my humble opinion, I think that there's very little risk to opening up the dura and sewing a patch in. What are the risks associated with all of this? 
uh, you know, really, like I said, it's cosmetic surgery. The risk is if you didn't pick the patient appropriately, um, you know, they don't get the relief from the headache they want. The one thing that I, I always make sure patients know is it can be something called a chemical meningitis. Just from us being in there and opening up the dura, there can be an inflammatory process that creates headache postoperatively that is treated with steroids for a period of time and it eventually goes away. <clears throat> because we're around the brain and spinal cord, we obviously have to talk about potential risks, but I, you know, I've never seen that. Uh, and then there can be the, the rare case in one, you know, in my thousand cases, one patient had a post-operative instability. Uh, we were trying to get by without having to fuse. But in those cases where we're concerned about instability, we then have to do something uh, uh, called an occipital to cervical spine fusion so that there is uh, reduced motion uh, at the junction between the skull. But again, in the adult population, that's a relatively rare uh, 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 problem uh, for Chiari-1 malformations. With that, uh, uh, I think I will stop and try to open the floor uh, to any questions that you might have. Tatiana, will you uh, uh, take the questions as they come in? Yes, I will. Uh, okay. You have your chat box up or it's okay. Uh, let's see. I don't have my chat box open. So do I have to, re I can go away from uh, full screen. There's a question from Naomi. Uh, is it okay to do surgery without having MRI sign beforehand? C I N. -E. Okay to do surgery without having MRI what? S sign C, C I N E beforehand. Oh, um, well, there is the debate about that Chiari zero, you know, where the patient doesn't have the the downward herniation of the tonsils, but they have fluid within the spinal cord. Uh, that's, that's a controversial area, uh, but certainly if, if a patient only has headache back at the base of their skull, but they don't have the MRI findings of the downward herniation or any abnormal flow, what I typically do is have the patient go to a headache specialist, a neurologist, and see whether we can treat their symptoms with medications rather than with surgery. Surgery should be the uh, treatment, uh, you know, the last final treatment if, if all you are presenting with is headache. Okay, there's another question from Anne Marie. What treatment options are recommended if you do have EDS? Ehler Danlos syndrome. You have Ehler Danlos syndrome and a Chiari malformation. Uh, then in that situation, uh, we consider, I have you meet with one of my spine specialists and we consider doing the decompressive procedure that I described, but at the same time, then we would do the fusion of the occiput to the cervical spine. Uh, you know, the downside to that is that you lose some range of motion in your cervical spine, but uh, with with the decompression and opening the ligaments, there's concern that you, we would be creating an unstable situation. So there, the conversation has to really focus on, on how bad are the symptoms and do they merit the surgical intervention? Um, there's a few more questions. One is from Crystal Pollard. How often do you see patients with Chiari that have migraine disorders? Is there a connection? There's not a connection. Uh, migraine disorders are much more common than Chiari disorders. So that the, the problem there is trying to distinguish whether the headache that you would be complaining about with migraine uh, 
is actually a migraine and not a Chiari. Again, I think that this is a team effort. We work with neurologists trying to dissect out what your real symptoms are and certainly not using surgery as the first answer. So if we treated the migraine headaches and everything went away and you had no physical findings, didn't have any weakness or, or any other worse symptoms of weakness in the hands, and all we were dealing with was headache, and if the headache neurologist took away that problem by treating your migraines, we wouldn't recommend surgery. If we took care of the migraine headache, but then the Chiari headache persisted, and that was intolerable, then we would talk about surgical intervention. Uh, here's another one. I am Kurt, Catherine Unicut. I am currently experiencing trouble being able to stand or walk. Original decompression was done in May 2017. Have you heard of Chiari causing this to happen? Um, as I said, depending upon the downward herniation, the amount of compression patients can present with symptom, lower extremity symptoms, uh, uh, you know, were the symptoms present preoperatively and they didn't get better or did they occur postoperatively? Uh, was there an associated syrinx? There are a number of things that we would have to go through in conversation that are probably beyond the scope of of this webinar, uh, you know, but uh, uh, happy to talk later. Okay, there's another question from Bridget. Post decompression surgery, one to two years post-op for Chiari 1.5, is lifting weights safe? Yes. I mean, once the decompression has been done, you should, number one, uh, uh, we will frequently see the uh, tonsils move back up. Uh, and you've been adequately, assuming that the decompression and everything was adequate, uh, you should be able to get back to a normal life. That's what I tell my patients. Uh, there's a question from Nicole. Is Chiari found in adults considered a progressive condition? Yes but it's variable progression. It's not linear. You can be asymptomatic for a long period of time uh, and then the symptoms can worsen. That's why the conversation has to be around, this is not a life or death situation. This is a quality of life situation. And how good is the quality of your life at the time that we meet for the first time and then we follow you and determine whether that quality is deteriorating and is it correlating with the MRI findings uh, uh, that you have over time. So it's that balance between quality of life and, and me as a surgeon being able to fix your problem. Um, we have a question from Jolie. What cognitive issues have you seen, especially with reoccurrence after decompression? This is not a, where the surgery is performed is not the cognitive portion of the brain. I will assume that we're not talking about somebody that has hydrocephalus because with hydrocephalus, there can be alterations in short-term memory and you know, the cognitive uh, uh, problems that are associated with that. In a patient that doesn't have hydrocephalus and then they get an unsatisfactory result from a, a Chiari procedure, there can be a fair amount of stress, obviously persistent headache pain, uh, anxiety related to that. If we don't feel that you would be a candidate for re-exploration based on subsequent CAT scans to assess the degree of bony decompression, what we do is uh, we have you meet with our neuropsychologist to try to figure out what the, the stressors are. And then we get you plugged in with our other team of psychologists that work with cognitive behavioral therapy to try to help you manage the uh, pain syndrome that you have. This is from Mary. 
How do you find a neurologist that truly understands Chiari? <laughs> Uh, I think the best way to do that is to find a neurosurgeon that isn't, uh, you know, trigger happy with surgery, uh, and and they have neurologists that they work with. I mean, I have neurologists that I work with regularly. Um, uh, uh, the other thing too is, I you know, there are most neurologists say that they are, uh, you know, they treat headache. Uh, I, I do find that there are, you know, neurologists that focus only on headache. That's all they do eight hours, 10 hours a day is see patients. And so uh, that uh, uh, neurologist is going to be a little bit more sensitive to the uh, implications of a Chiari malformation and probably direct you to a neurosurgeon more rapidly than a neurologist who uh, doesn't do that. You know, by and large, however, most neurologists, I would think, are sensitive to this, uh, or certainly should be. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I, you know, I, I think that headache neurologists and neurosurgeons that aren't trigger happy for surgery are good ways to start. I think we have time for a couple more. Uh, Lori, how often do you see recurrence of symptoms after surgery? What would you suggest someone do in this instance? The avoidance of symptoms postoperatively is really in clearly defining uh, number one, does the patient have Chiari? I mean, some, some surgeons will pull the trigger and operate on somebody that have, you know, two or three millimeter downward herniation, or they will operate only on the basis of the headache at the base of the skull and not try conservative management. So I, you know, number one, I, you know, uh, the way I avoid having that problem, and I, and I have not had many patients that have you know, severe post-operative issues after a Chiari, because I'm very careful about who I would select. The number, and, and, and secondarily, if, if the patient is having atypical kind of symptom, symptomatology that could be overlapping with the Chiari, I'm very candid about what the operation can do and the expectations. In a patient who's undergone surgery at another institution and, uh, uh, in meeting with them, I feel that they truly did have it. I, I very carefully look at the surgical procedure they went through and ensure that the bony decompression was adequate and that the uh, dural patch was adequate in size. There have been times where I've gone back in and they've only done a bony decompression, which I didn't think was adequate, or they've done a bony decompression without a patch. I put in a patch and the patient gets better. So there are, there are a number of variables that we can go through. And then if I don't think that I have much to offer, like I said, I then get involved with our cognitive behavioral therapy doctors. Okay, I think that um, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you, Dr. Stieg. Thank you, Tatiana, and thank you all for, uh, for listening.